word of prayer up. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house this evening. I pray, Father God, that you would uh, open up our hearts and minds, Father God, and give give Brother Gary the words to speak. And I pray on them, Lord, be brought unto you. I pray, Father, for our nation. I pray for our leaders. I pray that they would uh, turn to you and seek you with all their hearts. I pray, Father God, that you forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. For all these things, that's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, somebody pick out a song. <coughs> Thirteen. Thirteen. Do I know thirteen? I know thirteen. Let's do number thirteen. <laughs> Said not only that camp, but there's other camps. <coughs> so, anybody got anything to say? Sure, we're not. Uh, y'all don't have to turn on this 
Please don't. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> please do keep the demons in prayer because just like this morning at the meeting that we had here in Atlanta, Virgil brought up to our attention about how there are some camps who do not help other camps. And I don't know why. <coughs> there's talk about like there was a really good speaker from the Longview camp, Longview camp that came and helped us. But he don't want to participate with his own camp because they don't have meetings or anything. He said they don't uphold the, the Gideons like they should. So, yes, all Gideons, no matter who they are, young or old, need prayers. All the camps need prayers. Because if we don't do our job, which is to get the hands, Bibles into the hands that need them, then it's all for nothing. And everybody needs it. And just like I learned at the conversation training that I went to in Dallas on August the 13th, only about 5% of the people even share their faith outside of the church. That's a very, very small number. And so just like I told them this morning at Bethsaida, those words will help make up for some people that don't do it, but it ain't going to make up for everybody that don't do it. There is a big, big mission fit out there, as Brother Gary always tells us. There's people that's dying. There's people still in addiction. There's still broken marriages and broken homes. There's still fatherless out there that they don't know. And all I can say is, I know brother, I don't know if Brother Randy back there can hear me or not, but I thank God for youth pastors. Because I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have a youth pastor. Mm -hmm. But I had a few youth pastors were my father. But anyways, um, what I was even going to speak about in the first place. Is when I went to the Sunday school this morning at Bethsaida, one of the verses that jumped out at me from uh, Hebrews when we were studying it, it was, God is a consuming fire. What if we did, as a body of Christ, allow God to consume us as a consuming fire? I hear so much talk about, well, God, please save our nation. If God's going to do anything with our nation, it's going to start in the body of Christ. It's going to start right here in the church house. So we need to find whatever it is that's in our life that's causing us not to have that spark, to have that flame in our life, for Him to be like a consuming fire in our life. Because if He did, it would start changing in the church house. It would start changing in individual lives and homes and communities. And the nation could get turned around. Nobody from the White House is going to save us. I don't care how much you keep hoping for that, it's not going to happen. But anyways, please, whatever it is, an invitation at the altar is not just about people coming to Christ. I was talking to a couple people about that this morning. It's rededicating your life back to Christ if you're not right with Him. You can go to the altar and pray for your partner with children that's not there. It's to pray for a lost family member or whoever else. It's not always just for you. You can take it to the altar of God and pray for somebody else as well. Anyways, it's going to start in the church house. There's going to be change made in this world. I got one picked up this time. Let's sing 78. I think I, I think I got 78. I think I got enough breath, hopefully. <coughs> like I know what I don't know I don't know who you're playing. <laughs> <laughs>
I did, boy. I ate Dairy Queen. I ate German chocolate cake. I ate, oh my goodness. Yeah. I just turned 54. I had to eat it. I ain't had it since I was 34. You are allowed to breathe when you're singing. And I'm trying. I'm trying. Anybody got anything they want? Any, any, anything else? Say? Before we sing our last song. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to pick a song. Catherine wants 204. 204. What page? 204. Page 204. Take a deep breath. Take another deep breath. <laughs>
Y'all yeah. can't tell I'm stalling, can you? I'm not. Blaine, have you ever had a lesson? You've had some, I thought it was all, you play by ear though, don't you? Yeah. Has anybody heard him before? He is super. And his mother, what a song to be saying this morning. Are y'all hot? sing it tonight and uh, a few weeks ago uh, Debbie sang this song I'm gonna get where I can see it I'm not used to having the mic on the right hand side either. I dreamed of a city called glory so bright and so fair When I lived through the gate I cried holy The angels all met me there They carried me from mansion to mansion And oh what sights I saw But I said I want to see Jesus He's the one who dies for all. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, Holy, Holy, Holy. Then I clapped my hands and sang, Glory, Glory to the Son of God. I thought as I entered that city, my friends all knew me well They showed me the streets of heaven Succeed too numerous to tell I saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Mark, Luke, and Timothy But I said, I want to see Jesus He's the one who died for me. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, Holy, Holy, Holy. Then I clapped my hands and sang, Glory, Glory to the Son of God. Glory to the Son of God.
Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our bodies, our, our minds and our hearts, our bodies. I'm talking about food right now, Lord, forgive me. And, and Lord, bless this word for our hearts and our minds and help us to learn from it tonight and to understand that there is a simplicity and a sincerity that's combined for, for, for service to you. So Lord, help us not only to realize the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but understand that we're supposed to be sincere about it. So Lord, bless it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be talking about the simplicity and the godly sincerity that uh, that is mentioned in this uh, this verse uh, tonight. Uh, Paul addresses something here that, that we all need to, to try and understand, and, and that is why we rejoice. We rejoice. And he tells us about the testimony of our conscience. Now, how many of you have ever felt guilty? How many of you have ever going to bed at night and your conscience was bothering you and you couldn't sleep mm -hmm. and you'd wake up the next day and you'd still be bothered by it and you you couldn't think about anything else except what was bothering your conscience well the, the, the paul understands that although we're not saved through conscience we feel the holy spirit and the holy spirit is is connected with our conscience by the way there was a dispensation called the dispensation of conscience and it didn't work for man because the because man's mind heart was on evil continually, and so he, the, the Lord couldn't trust the man's conscience. But when the Spirit dwells in us, it's a whole different thing because the Spirit uh, addresses our conscience and brings our conscience to the fact that we have disobeyed and sinned against God, or we've done something wrong that we need to make right. And so the conscience is, is something that, uh, that sometimes when it gets, uh, the Scripture mentions that it gets seared with a hot iron sometimes, and we all understand what that's talking about. It just bugs us to death until we make it right. And it's a beautiful thing because our rejoicing a lot of times, it should not because our joy, it, it, it should never go away because our joy is because Christ is in us. But our rejoicing, what makes us smile and what makes us be glad to be at church and is sometimes in, in, uh, affected, our worship is affected because our conscience is not right before God. Amen. So Paul addresses this right here. And, and this is, he says, the testimony of our conscience that, that we have to have. Now, uh, it's hard to explain this, uh, but, uh, but all who have experienced it can understand this. Is that when, uh, when, when we come before God with a guilty conscience or a seared conscience, and we make it right with Him, have y'all ever done that? And we get down to business with God and we seek forgiveness from God and we seek for forgiveness from anyone that we have wronged in the process of that. Because uh, a lot of times our conscience is seared because we've wronged another person. We, we, we may have been right about what we wronged them about. We may have been right that they did wrong, but we did wrong by the way we addressed what they did and the way we approached them. Yeah, we've got to learn to do better at that kind of stuff. You know what? Hurt feelings have run more people away from the church house than any other thing. Hurt feelings. And somebody, all you got to do, if you come to church with a seared conscience and a bad mood, grumpy, grouchy, and jump down somebody's throat, you'll likely never see them again. Amen? We got to do better. So he understands that our rejoicing and our conscience are, are, are closely associated. So he, he wants us to make sure our conscience is clean and cleared before God. And we can do that before we come to church. Men, men and men, and this ain't bragging, we just pray before we leave the house to come to church. We want our conscience right. We want to be right with each other. And we fight like cat and dog go with her. And I have to go in there and plead and, and repent. But anyway, I'm just playing. That's not true. But when, anytime, anytime that you open up to God and you confess those things that are eating you up, there's nothing but good going to come out of it. Amen? Because God is the only one who can take that conscience and soothe it and let you know, son, everything's going to be all right. Daughter, everything's fine because I'm in control. I'm in the forgiving business. I'm in the, I'm in the business of grace. I'm in the business of mercy. And I'm going to give it to you right now. And I want you to, if you, got any, if you need to go talk to someone else, you go clear your conscience. You go get everything made right. And y'all rejoice and be glad together. And we can rejoice then. And that's what he's talking about. And so that is the simplicity. It sounds simple, but how come it's so hard to do? Think about it. How come it is so hard to do to say, I'm sorry? Or even worse, I, I was wrong. 
Those are tough words, aren't they? Some of the toughest words to say. And so we need to remember that, that God is always right. And when our conscience is seared and our conscience is burned, we need to soothe our conscience by opening up to God and confessing whatever it is that's got our conscience in such a bad way and let him bring our soul back into alignment with his Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what it's all about. That we need to keep our, our spirit aligned with his spirit. We need to agree with him. But listen, my spirit is carnal. And it's, it's wrong a lot. But his spirit is holy and is never wrong. You believe that? Amen. Amen. And so there, there's a war. There's a war that goes on in there. We all know about that. But we need to bear our souls to him. And it makes us feel clean. It makes us feel better. It makes us feel happy that we have done that with a holy God. And we have met the criteria that God has laid out in his word for us to come to him and bring those burdens and those things to him. You know, everything that we bring to God is not necessarily a sin. Sometimes it's a burden that we decide we want to carry without his help. Amen? Amen. And he can lift those burdens. He said, cast all your cares upon me. Bring your burdens to me. He wants us to do that. And when we do that and we bring them to God in the way that we're supposed to, then, then the Lord gives us this rejoicing that we can have and we can feel clean, we can feel usable again, and we can, we can make things good. Forgiveness happens and we are restored. Amen. And there's nothing like being restored. You know, I remember... You know, me and Anita, we've had a few fights, not very many. And I, I can say that we've been married 46 years and we have had very few fights. Especially, well, disagreements, many. But I'm talking about the knockdown drag out time, very few of those. And it's nothing better when you make up and, and you apologize to one another and, and, and you get forgiveness from each other and how much better it makes you feel. To, because you have a unity of purpose again restored to your household. That works the same way in the church. When you have a unity of purpose restored in the church, it makes everything better. And if we're not careful, we'll let that get out of control. Amen. Before we ever bring it to God, hand it over to God, and, and, and let the Lord take care of it for us. Because He is our source of power. And so how, how is this thing done? Our conscience is clean. We're restored. Uh, restoration occurs and and how is this done well Paul says that it's not complicated it must be done by simplicity you know what's simple about all this you just do it. amen you just do it if you don't do it it ain't simple no more if you do it it's obedience and God does his work God does what he told you he'll do. His yea is yea and his amen is amen. If you do it, if you don't do it, that yea and amen don't apply to you right now. Amen? Because you're not in compliance with God. And, and we need to get off of this kick that we don't have to do it. Yes, we do. We have to do what he says. Amen? Now, if you leave your kids home and you, you go out and say, we're going to be going out the dishes are dirty, and you tell the kids, now when I get home, I want these dishes clean. I want them dried. And I want them to put, be put in their place. I want the table clean. I want the kitchen floor cleaned up. How many of you mothers have done that? Mm -hmm. And then you go leave and you stay gone an hour and you come back. Ain't none of it been done. <laughs> what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Oh, baby, that's all right. I'll do it. That's what some of us do. That's the wrong thing to do. Amen. The right thing to do is what? Let them hear the <laughs> and tear the rumpus up and say, now get in there and do what I told you to do. That's the way you correct that. Now, the Lord is merciful. He's gracious. And sometimes he will pull the belt out. Sometimes he gives us a chance to soothe that and make that up to him. And we get to do where we do that a lot more with our kids, and that's okay if that's what you think you need to do, but it's not complicated. It is in simplicity and godly sincerity the gospel is written so even a child can understand it. You say, really? I just baptized, how old is Chloe? Ten. Ten. We just baptized a ten-year-old girl last week. Amen? Or week before last now. Amen? 
A child can't understand it. That's the simplicity of the gospel. What do they need to know? They need to know that Jesus came, that he lived, that he lived a sinless life, that he died for their sins, that he rose again, that he's poured out his spirit, and that he's coming back. That's what they got to believe. And when they believe that, according to the scripture, it says they, shall, they can be saved. Amen. Amen. That is the simplicity of the gospel. Men have gotten their two cents worth in there and made it so complicated, they want to make you think that they're the only ones that can teach you the gospel. They're the only ones that can tell you when you're saved. They're the ones that tell you when you're not saved. They're the ones that tell you when you're doing right. They're the ones that tell you, man, where does the Holy Ghost come in? What's his purpose? What's his job? What's he supposed to do? He, he says, he comes into you and saves you and says, I yield to this preacher over here. He'll take, he'll take it from here, boys. That's what some of them want you to believe. Amen. You know who those people are? They're Satan's preachers. Amen. They're false preachers. Amen. Amen. That's what they are. So that, that's the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is so simple that a child can understand it. A child can receive salvation. I, I loved it the night Melissa called me and told me that Jesse had been saved over at uh, Alamance. And, uh, and I was just tickled to death. Not jealous. Because she didn't get saved. I was tickled. That's what we were praying for that girl, to be saved. And she got saved over there. And then she called me later on and she said, I turned around and went back over to their house. I said, why? She said, Chloe says she wants to be saved. And I'm going over to their house. And that little 10 year old girl. And that's what it's about. That is the simplicity. They ask, you tell, they receive. Isn't that wonderful that it's that simple? Well, you know, there's a lot of preachers that say, well, no, that ain't the way that works. I, I need to hear this. I need to see this. I need to hear them do certain things. If they don't do what I want them to do, then I'll just pronounce them unsaved. We shake our hands and make fun. That happens. It happens a lot more than you think it does. Amen. They want to take away the personal relationship you have with Christ and say, you're going to have a relationship through me with Christ. And that, that ain't Christ. That's not Christianity. And that is not a, a preacher sent from God. The simplicity that Paul, he even made a remark to one of the churches in one of his letters, you have forgotten the simplicity. You've made church so complicated. Mm -hmm. You've made receiving Christ so complicated. Who can do it? Amen. We're allowed to do a lot of things as pastors and, and as, a, as a church. You remember what the Lord told the apostles? He said, what you bind in, on earth will be bound in heaven. What you, what, and all, you know, he, he told them that. The things you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. But one thing he didn't give us authority to do was change his gospel. And to make it into something that it's not. We already got that gospel. Amen. We got four books of it. They got red letters all in it. And they're the teachings of Christ. Amen. And it speaks to the lost man and tells us what he wants from us. He wants us to come unto him. He wants us to bow before him. He wants us to repent of our sins. He wants us to call on his name. He wants us to believe what the scripture says about him and that he wants to save us by filling us with his spirit. That's what he wants us to know. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Amen. It ain't rocket science. ain't complicated. Jesus came and did all the work, shed all the blood, took all the pain, and he did it for us so we could have a sim simple salvation. Amen. And then after that, we just keep coming to it. We just keep bringing them our issues, bringing them our problems, bringing in our, our, our conscience and our seer, our, our guilt. We bring in our sin and just get and lay it down at his feet. Amen. Just lay it down at his feet and say, Lord, forgive me for, for doing this. Confess it to him. Don't, don't say, well, Lord, if it hadn't been for old so-and-so, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Amen. You know why? Because we're all responsible for our own selves. And we need to learn how to take our responsibility. And, get, and don't make a difference if somebody did push your buttons. What you did when they pushed them is the part you've got to get, get control of. 
Amen. 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 You know, it's one thing for everything to be going hunky dory, and we say, "Well, oh, praise the Lord." But it's another thing when the whole world around us is falling apart, and we say, "Praise the Lord," with the same attitude, and and rejoice with the same the same enthusiasm that we do when things are great. Amen. That's what he's talking about, and that is the uh, simplicity. And so uh, the the gospel is 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 written that way. Uh, our problem is that it takes love and commitment on our part to experience these things. That's what we were talking about this morning. That it's not about how much the Lord loves us. We already know that. It's established how much He loves us. But what is not established is how much we love Him. And that comes in our life as we are saved and we begin to live our lives. And He says, if you love me, we'll keep my commandments. He said, when you keep my commandments and obey me, I'm going to show you more of who I am. That's the way we learn of God. Amen. If you try to study the Word of God and you're living out of the will of God, it ain't going to make no sense to you. Amen. Because the Word is the way He reveals Himself to us. When you obey the Word and you do it, do it, and it bears fruit, you think, wow, that worked. Why would we ever doubt that the word don't work? How do we get to the point where we doubt the word don't work? Amen. And yet I've heard so many people, they told me before, I ain't doing that. <laughs> okay. You ain't going to get any help then from him. <laughs> Amen. If you want God to help you, you got to do it. You got to do it right. And so I, it, it takes love, it takes commitment. And it takes one more thing. What is it? Somebody tell me. Okay. It takes humility on our part. We have to yield ourselves and get ourselves out of the way and let God have control. That's humility. Amen. So we have to have to the, the humility and then we have to obey. And of course, after the Holy Ghost is in us and we can't do any of this without the Spirit of God inside of us. That's already an established fact in the Scripture. Read St. John. Study St. John. And he'll tell you, without that Holy Ghost, you ain't going to know none of this stuff. You're not going to understand any of this stuff. You're not going to be able to reason anything. And you're not going to have any power, according to the book of Acts. And uh, because the Holy Ghost comes into us, the Spirit, and gives us the power to witness. And so God's direction to the saved person is to learn about Him, to study about Him. Now, how many of y'all... Well, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Just, I want you to think. How many of y'all study the Word of God one hour a week? Don't, don't, don't say anything. How many of you study the Word of God one hour a day? How many of you study the Word of God many hours? And many hours in a day. And I know we work. We have time. We have busy lives. Listen to me. You have to make time for God. That's what putting Him first means. I know I don't have time, but I have time for you, God. I know I don't have time to study. I've got a million things, but i got time to study that's that important. We need to make sure that the importance of, of God is first and foremost in our lives. That's born out in the scripture. Hey, what was the first commandment? That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. That's what Jesus said. And he said the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. So he merged those two and made them number one and number two in priority. Number one was what? Put God first. Now, do we do that? Or do we put God in where we don't have anything else going on? We make time for God, He'll take care of the time. <laughs> he'll give you He'll give you what He take time for Him if you're not careful. Amen. Amen. He'll do that because He loves you. So the same person, the same person must learn, must study the Word. And he, Paul goes on to say, pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? That tells me one thing. You ain't got to spend all your time on your knees. It, it don't hurt to do that sometimes. We need to do that sometimes. But that means when we're mowing the grass, can we pray? Yes. When we're driving down the road, can we pray? When we're taking a shower, can we pray? Yes. Amen. Anything we're doing, 
we can pray. We can, that's, that's why he said to pray without ceasing. That's what he, uh, Paul instructed people to do. And then we obey the commandments for what, what is the purpose we obey? We talked about it this morning. Anybody remember? You obey him because you love him. You honor him with your love by obeying him. And that's why it, a long, long, long time ago, a very wise prophet said to obey is better than sacrifice. None of the rest of it matters. We must obey. Samuel said that, by the way. And so Samuel told that, said that. And so that is the, when we obey the commandments because we love him, that is the key of our humility, and not to man, but to God. Amen? That is the key to our humility and our obedience to God. It is God in his word. Uh, it, 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 that is the, the, the key of our humility. It's not to man. It is to God in obedience. And that is what it means to be sincere. Okay, you show your sincerity by obeying that command that you put God first and you actually study and you learn about him. Jesus said that. He said, learn of me. That's what he told his apostles. Why would he tell them that? We got to know who he is so we can share with somebody else who he is. That's the most important thing you can ever share with a person. And so when we, and he says you don't do this, look at this. He, he said, not with fleshly wisdom. You can't please God in the flesh. That's scripture too. Your carnality is an enemy of God. You, so you can't be carnal. You can't please Him in the flesh. You can't yield to the flesh and, and please God. So it's not done with fleshly wisdom. That means by the wisdom of the world. Have, have y'all... <laughs> Been reading the papers and looking on Google and looking at the news and looking on TV and looking at the rest and just hear what our godly wisdom and our worldly wisdom is today. <laughs> this country's gone nuts. <laughs> worldly wisdom, boy, they're geniuses. I'm telling you. And worldly wisdom is in direct confrontation and conflict with godly wisdom. Amen. 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 That's why they call us names. It's going to get worse than that. Amen. It's going to get worse than that. So we are, we are, we could be, and we can't trust our fleshly wisdom. Why? Because we're born in sin. We're shaping in iniquity. We're born that way. Amen. So we have to, we have to realize that we're broken. We are broken in our wisdom. When we are wrong, we want to get angry. We want to stay upset. We want to backslide. We want to fight. We want to get even. That's worldly wisdom. That's the fleshly wisdom. But so what does the wisdom of God say? You don't do these things. You don't get even. Why does the Lord tell us not to get even? Because he's going to do it for you. Amen. Amen. That's what he tells us. You don't have to get even. I'm, I'll take care of that for you. So you don't do it. I don't even want you to try. I don't want you to hit anybody. I don't want you doing any of that. And if you get hit, what does he tell us to do? I got tickled. I was watching one of them old westerns in the 50s. And when they were getting into a bare knuckle fist fight, and this guy come up, and this guy was supposed to be a Christian, a preacher, and, and this guy, I mean, he hit him right far on the jaw. Boom! He said, what are you going to do about that? And he just turned another cheek at him. And boy, he laid it on him. What? And he hit him again. He said, now what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. He didn't tell me what to do after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's worldly. <isn't> it? <laughs> he didn't tell me what to do after the second one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's not God's way for us. Amen. And, and so he also tells us that we can't speak or act uh, the, the, the way God wants us to without his grace. God's grace. We need the grace of God. We need the mercy of God. God's grace becomes greater as our faith is increased. Did you know that? 
As your, as your faith increases, uh, God's grace becomes greater. This, this is all enhanced as we experience God in obedience. That is what it means for God to reveal more of himself to us or show us more of himself as we uh, obey the Lord. And so that is how we know that the Lord is in us. Okay? He is in us and we are in him. Uh, we talked about that this morning, a two-way street. We, he is in us and we are also in him. And so he goes on to tell us because of this relationship, what a God we have, that, that, uh, that we have had our conversation in the world, we were all lost before we were saved. Our conversation is not talking about what we talk about here. It's talking about the life that you live, the lifestyle. There's a lot being said about lifestyles today. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have the transgender lifestyle. We have the homosexual lifestyle. That's all brought up as a lifestyle. That's what the, talk, the Bible's talking about it when it mentions the conversation. It's mentioned in our lifestyle. And so our lifestyle is changed when we are, are converted uh, by Jesus Christ and we're saved. And our conversation of, in the world is changed. Our conversation, uh, uh, we are not supposed to continue in a worldly lifestyle. After we are saved, we are to be different. Listen to me visibly different. Amen? Amen. We are to be visibly different in word and in action and in deed. Now, we are to do everything for the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. How can this even be possible? How, how can we do this? Let me read the scripture. This comes from Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Listen to this scripture. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ, now listen to this, is all and in all. Put on, therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, that means from deep within, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now look at this. Forbearing one another. This has become my new national anthem of a preacher. Forbearance. Amen. <coughs> we must learn to forbear one another. We've got to learn to love one another. We have to learn to forgive one another. We have to learn to like one another. I've heard, how many of y'all have heard, I, I, I love them, but I don't like them? <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Is that scriptural? No. You think God loves you, but don't like you? Now he might hate your sin, but he ain't never quit loving you. He ain't never going to quit loving you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> He may not like your sin, but he loves you. Amen. So forbearing one another, and listen to this, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Now how does Christ forgive us? How does he forgive us? Y'all don't want to answer that, do you? Because it's going to kill a lot of excuses when you answer that truthfully. Over and over. Huh? Over and over. He keeps on forgiving us. He forgives us totally and completely. He forgives us and don't bring it back up to us anymore. Brother Gary. Yes, sir. On the TV, they've been showing this guy that knocked this guy out with a sucker punch, and he's been in jail I don't know how many times. Do you love him but like him? You love him. Period. But do you like him? You don't like what he does, that's but you I'm love saying. him. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't like what they do. You love them. I mean, if you got kids that do other stuff all the time, you don't like what they do. You you still love them, though, don't you? Amen. And you are you rejoice when they give you a reason to even like them anymore. 
And God calls us His children. Think about it. So that's the reason He makes those comparisons in our lives and who we are in Him. And so He says, He says, if any may have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do you also. And above all these things, put on charity or love. Put on love above all these things, which is, now look at this, which is the bond of perfection. Oh, we don't have a perfect church, do we? But as long as we have love, we're bound to perfection. Amen. Because we have Christ in us and He is perfect. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To thee which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh-oh. That's why studying comes in. How are you going to know the word if you don't study it? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What does James write to us in, in the book of James and tell us? If any man lack wisdom, what do you do? Ask him for it. And what, how will he give it to you? Liberally. Abundantly. He'll pour it out on you. But ask him for it. Lord, I love your word. I just don't have the wisdom to use it. Would you please grant me wisdom? And that he promises you he'll just put a bucket load on top of you. And give you opportunity to show you he's done it. Amen. But we got to want that. Amen. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing. What does admonishing mean? Spurring one another on. Lifting one another up. Encouraging one another. Not saying, I wish so and so wouldn't come up here when we're done a work day. They don't ever do nothing right. <laughs> Put them out there in that flower bed. They can't hurt nothing out there. That's the look at Debbie and Rick back there. <laughs> Put them out there in that flower bed, them poor weeds. They can't do wrong out there. Except <laughs> 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 maybe pull a few flowers. You used to say you would go wash dishes and to keep from doing it again, you'd break a few so you didn't have to wash them. <laughs> well, if you break them, you don't have to wash them. You get to them away. All right. So it says, so, so teaching and admonishing one another. How? Look at that. In Psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs sing with grace where? To who? To the Lord. Ah. I got a song in my heart to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. That's scriptural. I ain't making this stuff up. This is in the Word of God. This is Colossians that, that Paul's writing it. In Colossians 3, verses 10 through 17. He said, So have, have this in your heart. Amen. And whatso now this is a good good one, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or in deed, that means not only what you say, but what you do, do all how? Ooh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And while you're doing it, give it thanks to God. Give it thanks to God. The Father by Jesus. Man, we serve an awesome God, don't we? Amen. He's done so much for us. If we could just get it down and learn about what He wants us to do and learn how He's equipped us to do the very things that He said He wants us to do. He's given everyone the means to do exactly what He says. So it's up to us to what? Do it. Do it. It's, listen to me. It's up to us to know it and it's up to us to do it. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to want to know it, and we're supposed to want to do it. So, we must put on Christ. Now listen to this. I, this is one of my famous Gary statements. He must dwell in us, and we must dwell in Him. Now listen to this. Him in us changes our minds, and our hearts, and our mouths. Mm -hmm. Him in us does that. Now listen to this. <laughs> us in Him is the outward display of the good works that we do for His glory, that other people see. 
So him in us changes us from within. Us in him puts that on display for the world to see. We need to put him on display. We need to quit look, having the world look at us, me, me, me. What have I done? I done, I done. How good am I? How good am I? How good am I? And let us see him. And let them know that what they see in us is not us, it's him. And give him that glory and that praise. If he's in us, he will reflect back on them. Exactly right. If he is in us. It will be a reflection in our life of Him. Amen. We can't walk in His light without the light shining in us and through us. And I heard this great, beautiful thing one time. Because and somebody said, well, we're all broken. And somebody said, yeah, but you know what? You can put a candle in a vase that's not broken, and the light just comes out the top. But you put it in a vase that's broken, <coughs> it comes out all around it. That's the way we are. When he is in us. We're broken, yeah. We're still sinners. We still need his grace. We still need his mercy. We, but we can confess it and we know what to do with it. Give it to him. Let him cleanse us from it. But we're broken and as broken as we are. When he dwells in us, that light comes out of the brokenness. It reflects through every crack, every missing piece, every chunk that's been knocked out. It shows and it shows out from inside of us. That is what it means for us to walk in Him. I hope we can all do that and understand. This is simple. This is the simplicity of the gospel. And it's supposed to be used in sincerity. <clears throat> Godly sincerity. That we are sincere about our walk with God and our relationship. Brother Gary, <coughs> uh, the uh, loving someone you know, like the character I mentioned a while ago, or <coughs> rapes or kills people. You know, it's hard. That's one of the hardest things in the world to love somebody like that. Mm -hmm. But like you said this morning, the only way you can do that is through the through the Lord. You we can't pray, do it. Pray about it, and yeah. and He can get you to that point. Yeah, we we can't do that without Jesus. Right. We just cannot. It's not in us to do it that way. I keep thinking about the the, the black church that got bombed and north of South Carolina, one of the Carolinas, here a few years ago in the media, boy, they just wanted to make it a hate crime, they wanted to make it about a black guy bombing the church, and you know what those chief, those, those black saints did? They, they got interviewed and they said, we forgive that man. We want him to know the love of Christ. <coughs> we can replace that building. We want him to know who Jesus is. And you know, the, they didn't report on them another time after that. And ended that right there. And ended all of it. Why? Because they showed them who Jesus was in their lives. They gave them an outward look at who Christ was inside of them. What was strange about that too is the bigger <coughs> churches wanted to come in and spur hate. The bigger, and they wouldn't do that either. Mm -hmm. So they had all left too. It was kind of a it kind of backfired on what the media and the other evil. Yes, it did. Preachers thought. Because see, the worldly idea. And the godly idea are, are totally different. It's totally different. And so let's, look, let's reflect and let people see Christ in us. Let's show them something they want. Let's show them something they need to desire to have. Let's show them what a real Christianity looks like. And what a real Christian man or woman looks like. Let them see it through our brokenness. Let them see the light of the Lord. Amen. Right, any other comments or questions? Thank y'all for listening tonight. We're going to do a short invitation. Then we'll have a bid, please. Would you stand? <coughs> Maybe you hear tonight and some of these things. I've said have sparked something in you by the Spirit. And you're not doing exactly the way the Word tells us to act and react with others. These altars are open for you to pray and to bring those issues that the Lord has revealed to you in your own heart. 
to him. Bring them to him. Give them to him. And let him take care of them for you. Let him wash you, cleanse you. And he'll take that sin away from you. He'll take that trouble from you. He'll take that burden from you. And he'll lay it under his blood. And he'll wash it white as snow for you. And then ask him, what do you, what do you want him to replace it with? Lord, help me to live for you that others may see. Not in arrogance, not in pride, but in godly sorrow, godly humility. And let my light shine before me. You know, that got a lot of people killed in the early days of the church. It's getting people killed right now in this world. In North Korea, in the Muslim nations, Christians are getting persecuted. They're having to hide to worship, and yet they still do it. Know it. If they get caught, they're probably going to go to prison or die. Yet they've got something that won't allow them to stop. Listen to me. We're going to stand beside these people one of these days in glory. Amen. We need to remember our brothers and sisters worldwide in these countries that don't allow things. Communist China. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Taiwan as they look to the day that looks like it's coming soon when there's going to be a full-scale war against them and they're going to be annexed like Hong Kong was. The world's fixing to change before us. Hardly because God said it would. But with all the change comes opportunity. With the great falling away that we see in the churches today, we also see an opportunity for revival. And it's done, and it comes through people who have Christ in them and who are in Christ. And they have their Christianity on display. In its simplicity, in its sincerity, and they're bringing people to Christ. We need to all share in that work. We need to support that work. We need to pray for that work. And we need to be those people who do those things. Amen. And the more, if, if you receive power from the Holy Spirit, the fuller you are of the Spirit, the more power you're going to have. So stay full. Don't be ashamed to say, Lord, fill me again. Fill me again. And let me be your child in this world. God bless you all. Thank you for being here tonight. And I pray that the Lord has spoken to you and touched you in some way. You've heard from his word tonight. And uh, we're going to have our dismissal prayer. And if you'd like to stay with our business meeting, you're more than welcome. And if you don't want to stay, you, you can just leave. Amen. We'll make that. That's simple too, isn't it? And so we're going to uh, call ourselves into a special call. Uh, not special call, but our, our annual. No, not annual. I just don't even know what I'm talking about, do I? Our, our bi monthly business meeting. Let me say it like that. John Terry, would you pray for my business meeting? Heavenly Father, thank you for the, your word tonight, dear Lord. And, um, I pray that we just uh, take time out of our lives to spend more time with you, dear Lord, to, to learn more and more about you, to uh, trust and obey you, dear Lord, that you reveal more and more yourself to us, dear Lord. Um, I just pray as we go into this business meeting, dear Lord, I pray that we just. Uh, um, put you at the forefront, keep you in front, keep our eyes on you, dear Lord, and that you just lead us and uh, we follow the path that you'd have us to go, dear Lord. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.